Hello everybody and happy 2019. I don't know what you mean, I'm not a month late. Stop saying that please. Today I wanted to talk about some of my favourite, favourite, not most important, favourite, big distinction, paleontological discoveries and research of 2018. Let's start with a little fossil discovery that I am totally not biased in including because a couple of my friends were the authors of the paper, no, not biased at all. <laughs> Andrew is a really, really important and really cool fossil because he is the smallest Diplodocus skull that we have ever found. Also, he's adorable. Andrew is really important because he shows us much more about allometric growth in sauropods. Allometric growth refers to when the proportions of an animal grow at a different rate to its overall growth. So in humans, we don't have gigantically baby proportioned heads on adult bodies. We have allometric growth in our head size. So as we get taller and bigger, proportionally our head gets smaller. Andrew also shows this. In fact, we get a similar sort of thing going on with him where he has the big cute eyes, a sort of little rounder, smushier little face. Let's stop baby talking about a dinosaur. Another really cool thing is that Andrew shows heterodonty which, if you know anything about sauropods, isn't really seen in adult sauropods. So in diplodocoids you get the sort of peg-like teeth, and in uh, macronarians you get the more leaf-shaped teeth. Andrew actually has a mix of both of these, which of course has led to some debate as to whether Andrew is actually a juvenile. They have done the histology, he is a juvenile, but whether he's a juvenile of another species as opposed to a juvenile diplodocus. But Again, possibly because of bias, I'm going to trust the authors on the paper of this one because having met them, they know what they're talking about. Moving on, the sort of big paper that we ended the year on was feathery pterosaurs. So while we've known about pterosaur fuzz or pycnofibers pretty much for as long as we've known about pterosaurs, this is the first instance where we've actually seen proper branching filament structures that could be homologous to the feathers that we see in dinosaurs and birds, which would, if it's correct, push the origin of feathers back from the ancestor of dinosaurs to the ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And at this point, when we've pushed back the origin of feathers from just the theropods to the origin of dinosaurs. And now we've gone even further. We have to ask ourselves, when does it stop? Send me all your feathery frog drawings down below, please. Another cool end of year discovery that I'm almost certainly gonna pronounce wrong, Lissowitchia. This guy definitely deserves to be included. It's been previously thought that synapsids, the group that encompasses mammals, didn't truly reach gigantic sizes until after the fall of the dinosaurs, after the KPG extinction. Lissowitchia kind of blows this out the water by the fact that it's an elephant-sized, approximately nine-ton dicynodont from the late Triassic, which puts it before most of the dinosaurs and before the truly giant dinosaurs. So while Lissowitchia would have been walking around, there were things like Platyosaurus, which is the biggest sort of dinosaur you get at that time, and they're comparable in size, which brings into question why did the dinosaurs go on and things like Lysowitchia and the Dicynodonts, why did they die out? On top of this, Lysowitchia is also the youngest Dicynodont we have, coming from the late Triassic. Other cool things to note about this discovery is its upright posture in a clade of sprawlers and semi-sprawlers and the fact that it's from Europe, where dicynodonts as a group are relatively poorly known. So hopefully with more exploration in Poland and the rest of Europe, we'll find more of these, maybe similarly sized, maybe even larger dicynodonts. 2018 was an amazing year for naming species full stop. For example, the Natural History Museum in London named over 270 new species alone. And we are currently in an age where more dinosaurs are being named more frequently than ever before, with an average of almost one per week, which is crazy. As such, there were quite a few dinosaurs named in 2018. But what makes this one that I'm about to talk about so special? Shiny. 
Again, I'm going to stress, this isn't the most important discoveries of 2018. This is my personal favourite. And so if I want to include a shiny opalized dinosaur known only from a dentry, I'm going to include a shiny opalized dinosaur only known from a dentry. Weewarasaurus was found near Australia's Lightning Ridge, an incredibly famous locality for mining opals. And if you know anything about the opal industry, you know that it is massive in Australia. Most of the world's opals come from Australia. Weewarasaurus itself was a small ornithopod dinosaur, as I said, known from a beautifully opalized dentary containing these stunningly gorgeous leaf-shaped teeth. This dinosaur would have probably been bipedal or facultatively bipedal and it would have had a beak at the end of its mouth. Another notable colourful dinosaur from 2018 is Kaihong Judy, which I'm sure I've said wrong, a colourful paravian theropod. And what's cool about this one is we know the colour of it, and the colour of it has actually given it its name. Kaihong means rainbow, and this comes from the fact that melanosomes preserved within the feathers of this dinosaur have been inferred to have produced iridescent patterns, especially on the head, back, and around the base of the tail, which scientists have theorised would have been similar to those seen in hummingbirds, and so could potentially have been gorgeous rainbow colours. Sticking with dinosaurs, because I don't know if you can tell but I like dinosaurs, we have the discovery of the smallest Mesozoic dinosaur tracks, and this is an absolutely adorable discovery. These tracks are from a small dromaeosaur. You can tell this because they're didactyl, or they only preserve two fingers, two toes, in the imprint. This is because the second toe in dromaeosaurs is held aloft when walking. The second toe, because you get the dew claw going backwards, so it's... Just ignore that finger, and it's... it's like that. Yeah, that's a really great illustration of how dromaeosaurs walk, Emily. Well done. Well done. Side communication for the ages. But what makes these tracks so cute is the fact that they are just over one centimetre long which makes the track maker approximately the size of a sparrow. Or, to put it in layman's terms, freaking adorable. These tracks were discovered in South Korea and are of Cretaceous age. It's pretty poor practice to assign an actual species name to a track when you don't have pretty solid evidence for what made the track. As such, they've been given an ichnogenus, which I'm just gonna write down below, because I'm gonna say it wrong. And had enough of that on this video. The ichno part of an ichno genus referring to the fact that these are animal traces and ichnology is the study of animal traces. It's unclear as to whether the tracks belong to an adult or a juvenile animal but we can all hope that they were made by an adult animal and it's exactly as cute as we're all imagining. As you almost certainly know it's incredibly rare to get any kind of soft tissue preservation in fossils. So it's especially exciting whenever we find any kind of soft tissue preserved, especially when that kind of soft tissue hasn't been seen in an animal before. So we get to learn something brand new about a whole group of animals. This is the case with finding ichthyosaur blubber. Marine mammals have a thick layer of blubber which keeps them warm in the cold ocean. But there's a fundamental difference between marine mammals and marine reptiles in that marine mammals are endothermic. They're warm-blooded, they can produce their own body heat metabolically, whereas we don't see a big blubbery turtle walking about or swimming about. Blubber is useless without endothermy. Marine turtles rely on staying in warm, shallow-ish waters and having the sun heat them to be able to go about their daily business. The fact that we have found blubber in ichthyosaur fossils suggests quite strongly that they were endothermic, able to produce their own body heat. And this actually lies in with what we've inferred about ichthyosaurs from other fossils, such as Ophthalmosaurus. Due to its enormous eyes, it's been inferred to be a deep water hunter, and so there's no form of external heat to warm them. And this is where the blubber comes in. Warm-blooded ichthyosaurs. Other super cool discoveries and research that I don't really want to go into and make this video super long include coloured eggs from Deinonychus, my favourite dinosaur. Coloured eggs are easier to spot and therefore suggest that Deinonychus parents probably sat and looked after their egg. We also have this incredible fossil which shows, hopefully, preserved bird lungs. Again, soft tissue preservation in fossils. And if this turns out to be true, we can learn a lot more about the internal anatomy of early birds. A study on the bone anatomy and biomechanics of ankylosaur jaws 
and what this can tell us about tongue mobility in dinosaurs. Essentially that they didn't have much. A paper on the biomechanics and feasibility of Archaeopteryx flight, which comes to the conclusion that they probably were able to fly sort of in a similar manner to a pheasant. And that is it for my roundup of my favourite 2018 paleontological discoveries. If I didn't even touch on your favourite paleontological discoveries of the year, please leave a comment down below so I can learn more and hopefully you can bring me around. I will hopefully be doing another one of these at the end of this year. Hopefully I'll be doing it before February of 2020. Who knows? Maybe I'll do something on time in my life. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learnt a little something and I will see you in the next one. <coughs> 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 Bloody hell!